So, welcome everybody to our Bunker Base Design Theory training. I've been wanting to do this for a while. Usually what I do is mostly the basic bunker building training since usually we get a lot of new people each war and they are often interested in building, but it's not something that is very easily learned in this game. Uh, a lot of the stuff that I am about to tell you is like tribal knowledge or stuff that I've learned from experience. Um, but small uh, disclaimer, um, it's always the case in building and in Foxhole in general that people will disagree with the things that I say, like they'll disagree on certain design principles or, uh, well, mentions or claims that I make. Um, that's totally okay. Um, if you have more input to give based on your own experience during the training, please feel free, but do wait until the end of the slide like I asked before. Another disclaimer is that most of this knowledge uh, I've gained from um, being in the bunker, sorry, the Better Builder Bureau Discord. Um, it's a Discord for wardens, um, both loyalists and people that are here for a single war, where we try and improve overall warden building. I am part of the surveyor team over there. At the end of the training, I will drop a link to this Discord. Um, it has a lot of the knowledge that's in here. Um, it's been put up there um, mostly uh, by Noodle, Shredder, uh, Seiko and a couple of other main builders. These are guys are very smart, very knowledgeable and very kind. And if you ever do need help with certain aspects of the things that I teach you here, um, you can go over there and ask those people. So a lot of the graphics and stuff are also borrowed from there. So you'll, you'll probably find out later. Um, today's topics are, first of all, an overview of what the training is. And then I will go over the seven steps of bunker design. Um, they are seven steps. They are identifying needs, selecting general locations, considering your environment, estimating your resources, weighing your options, knowing your enemy and placing the defenses and systems. And at the end, I'll go over what's next for whenever you've built the base, like what's next for you. Um, first of all, the overview. Uh, my motivation for doing this training is to increase the amount of need for and interest in building among FMET. FMET is, of course, a logistics only regiment, but we do do a lot of building. Sometimes we are forced to, sometimes we want to because we have a facility to defend or we have like a seaport to defend. It's always been something that FMET's dabbled in, uh, but I don't think we have very many intermediate expert builders within the regiment. So this is also a way to share that knowledge and hopefully make a couple more people enthusiastic about it so that it's not all coming down to a couple of builders. The goals of the training are to increase this knowledge level of FMET's intermediary builders to hopefully one day become master or expert builders, um, the sharing of tribal knowledge, and helping to get as many FMETers on their way to become those master builders. I do assume you have basic bunker building knowledge, like the stuff that you see written here. Uh, if you don't, sucks for you, but I'll teach you another time. <laughs> um, but yeah. First of all, the first step in designing a bunker base is to consider its purpose. Why are you building this bunker base? What do you want to achieve? There's a couple of main uh, aims that most bunkers have. Um, they all fill a different niche or a different need that the faction has. I always say, if your bunker base is not fulfilling one of these needs, please do not build it. Like. The, suck, the sucky thing about Foxhole is if you're building, even in the far back line in like a mostly empty region, if you're just building for the sake of building or for LARP, um, sadly enough with the new MSOP modifier system, you're actually hurting other builders around you. Um, if you do end up like wanting to try your hand in like a safer area, uh, please always discuss with the current builders that are there and ask them if they're okay with it. If they say no, please move to another region because um, it's, it's just a lot of pain as a builder when you get people building things that don't matter. And the bunker bases that do matter are listed here. The first and most important one is the one that I'll be going over and using as an example today. It's the bunker base that fortifies a key strategic position. What is a key strategic position? We'll go over that later. There's different other, or, or other different kinds of bunker bases like push BBs um, that provide forward spawn points and AI. Um, BBs that are built to stop partisans, BBs that are built simply to enable a global spawn point, for example, next to a seaport in the back line. And they can also just simply be used to extend AI or Intel range. Uh, this is, these are some examples. The first one is a, a bunker base that I've built this war at Spit Rocks. It fortifies Spit Rocks, which is a very important relic base, but we'll mention it a lot during the training, so we'll go over it later. Uh, the second one is a simple anti-partisan base. Uh, somebody 
first built this with using halberds, which is a tier two pattern, uh, which is easily upgraded to tier three. But as you can see, it's mostly rifle garrisons. It's unpowered. It's low maintenance. It's simply to stop partisans from walking into a certain area. And a final example would be the seaport BB that I mentioned. Just building it very close to a seaport so that you don't have to walk like two minutes before you get to the seaport from whatever the global spawn point in that city is. How do you identify such a need? Uh, when or how do you know how to build a bunker base? Because um, usually at the start of the war, I'll pick out a plan for myself. I'll be like, hey, this war, this is what I want to build and I'll stick to it. Uh, and your decisions should, should always be built upon identifying those needs and filling them. Um, when you have built a lot in the game or you've been around for a very long time as a veteran, at some point you will use your game knowledge to determine where uh, the most important and most critical locations are to build these bunker bases. Like war after war, wardens usually build in the same spots, even during the different layouts, there will be certain spots that are key. Um, some top examples are Mousetrap in East versus West Wars or Spit Rocks in actually most wars. Um, and there's also usually giant bases around Lock Moor for the Colonials, for example. Um, you can also be instructed by others. It's possible that we'll have an infra infrastructure lead who will uh, create a task for you or somebody will ask you directly like, hey, do you know somebody who can build up this place and you can go do it. Uh, you can also infer this need through context. And what I mean by that is, uh, for example, if there is a location that has a coal field, for example, which is in a nice choke point, but it's also pretty close to the enemy, like our own facility this war, you will need bunker bases and defenses to defend the place. And you can also use historical data. In FMET, we have a channel called InfraFact List. Uh, you can go back over the, over the wars. We've only started this recently, so I think it's only War 107 onwards. But there will be posts uh, about bunker bases and where they've been placed. You can use it both as inspiration and to tell where it's useful to build these things. Um, there's also a couple different warden cooperation servers like WM or WA, uh, where they discuss engineering or bunker bases. Then you can see where people are building. Uh, you can also tell from foxholestats.com where most uh, wars the, the front line is situated at, and it's always good to build near the front line. And the Better Builder Bureau Discord that I mentioned also has a directory of bunker bases. Um, usually when these, these the, when a base is posted in this directory, it's always in a critical position. So any of these BBs would be good to copy or improve upon. And that's where I leave some room for questions. All right, so preparing your build. So let's say you've identified a need and the one that we've selected for this training is to fortify a key position. How do you start? Um, the best thing to do is to start planning this base before war start or during the first few days so that you have plenty of time to tech up. And also because during the early game, uh, most of the enemy threats are a lot less uh, strong. So, for example, during the first few days, you don't need to worry about ballista rushes and shit, so it's just less of a headache to start building then. And also, not unimportantly, uh, if you wait too long into the war, most of the good spots will be taken by other builders who have identified a need and filled it. Um, so if you want to build a big base or like defend something really important, it's usually most important that you start either at war start or during the first few days. Some things you can use to scout such a location is the image on the right hand side, which is foxholstats.com. Um, this is an example of what I did this far with like a smaller group of builders. We cycled through a couple different locations that we could build at. Um, we got together in a group DM. We shared certain locations that we would be interested in. Uh, these are all around important relics, as you can tell. And well, what you're looking for really is flat ground, first of all, and you can tell this with the improved map mod or foxholestats.com. If it's a very hilly area, um, you won't be able to build there properly because no patterns will fit. And you need pretty sizable patterns to defend key positions. So flat ground is the main thing. Uh, flat ground does not, does not mean that there's no obstructions. There could be fucky rocks or trees or obstacles around, which you really can only tell by visiting the place uh, during... Uh, another war or a current war or during dev branch or resistance phase. Um, ideally, you would build around static base AI. The reason I say that is because static bases such as town halls and relic bases have 150 meter circle of AI, while regular BBs only have 80 meters and they also start with AI at war start. So <clears throat> if you're building there, you're immediately pretty well defended and you don't need to tech AI. You only really need to tech 
um, garrisons and concrete and obs and shit. So that's very useful. Um, of course, there are also critical locations like the middle one here that you see on the right next to Alad's Bite, which is not around any relic. Um, but it is still an important choke point because it's between the mountains. And it's also, I believe, no, this is not at the top of a hill, but there's a small hill next to it that you can also build. Um, the reason choke points are good to build is because they form an impassable wall, um, in theory, because, of course, there are glitches and shit, but, I mean, we'll go into that later. Um, and these choke points are usually where a road passes through these impassable uh, world uh, assets, like mountains or bulwark or water. Um, and it's usually on the road from a border base or from town to town to the VP. Uh, that's what we would consider a choke point. And the reason you want to build on top of a hill is for two main reasons. Uh, due to the elevation difference, um, they will have to fight uphill. So if their uh, their their vehicles are slowed down, um, the 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 players on top of the hill, when they have arcing ammunition such as bone saws, they get a little extra range, and it's also harder to uh, both bino into and shoot artillery into a higher position. Uh, and it's easier to shoot down from there and your vision will be better. So that's why it's always good to fight on top of, or to build on top of hills. Um, building among along major lodgy roads is critical. Uh, if you build your base in the middle of nowhere, it's known as a fort go around where they don't even need to kill you. They can just build along the road and keep you contained while they are on their way to a victory point or whatever, and they can just starve you out. So if you're not building on or near a road, it's really, I don't know, not that smart to do. Um, you do want to build uh, in a place that defends targets of value, and by that I mean victory points, static bases, but also uh, sometimes stuff like gaps in the bulwark are important for colonials to cover, um, or like major partisan routes and that type of stuff. Um, then, pre-war planning, I usually go on foxelstats.com and I measure out how far a RSC can shoot into your region. The RSC has to shoot from outside the rapid decay zone, and they like, well, the, the best tactic for an RSC is to park it outside the region you want to attack, both so that you don't have to deal with queues and also so that you don't get howly retaliation. Um, and it's also uh, smart sometimes to build outside of naval gun range, which would be 225 meters plus. The reason it says plus is due to wind. Um, and we all know what happened with the nuke this war, and that was built inside that range. It's a risk, but I mean, in this case, it, it worked out terribly. Uh, you can build within these ranges um, if you are considerate of two things. If you are building inside of RSC range, you have to be like hyper vigilant with your bunker base and scouting the enemy side. You, you, would, you would like to have an intel center or maybe like every single day go out and to see the or check out the RSC spot and check if they've built there or whatever. It's a lot of effort, so I like to build outside of those, but there's not many good locations in the game where that can happen. Uh, so sometimes you're forced to build inside RSC range. As for naval, um, it's counterable if you place enough QRF already, and if you have enough, and by enough I mean a shit ton of howitzers. Battleships are kind of disgustingly accurate. I really don't know how that's balanced, but it's something we just have to deal with until it's changed, or maybe never gets changed, and we just have to adapt as builders. Critical for a building is to have a depot or a seaport nearby. In this example, we ended up picking spit rocks. Over here, uh, it has a seaport that we can ship stuff into, and there was also a depot at Lockheed that we could use. Um, the reason you want that is because you can safely store your vehicles or QRF vehicles, but you can also store supplies and materials that you want to supply your base with. Water access is nice, it's not truly necessary, but it's just a lot more work if you don't have the water access. You also want to be pretty close to your regiment's area of operations. In this case, when we built Spit Rocks, we had water access to Saltbrook. Um, we did get some supplies from there from time to time, such as concrete or uh, basic supplies whenever we asked. This is also good to discuss with your regiment, of course, but having the support or at least access to the supplies of the rest of the regiment is very good in case of emergency. And finally, but not least importantly, is the nearby resources. Um, there's a couple you got to keep in mind. Salvage and comp mines are critical for... Uh, MSOP production, but also for concrete uh, production. If you have both nearby, that's very good. The more salvage mines, the better. Uh, usually these mines are not really used for scrooping unless there's a refinery in the region. Um, and even then still, with Spit Rocks this war, we were lucky and we have a single salvage mine within our perimeter of defenses that nobody else is really using. 
Uh, if you can have one of these salvage mines within your defenses, you can also build a mad fac and then make your own MSOPs and be a happy camper because you will only need to drive like 10 seconds from your MSOP fac to your tunnels, which is very nice. And in the same vein, it's also good to build near oil fields. It's not always possible on the mid or front line, but being near an oil field means you get petrol, which is very good for your mine. Mines are exponentially more useful uh, to make MSOPs with if you have petrol and keep uh, petrol production up. And finally, it's nice to have a refinery nearby for making easy diesel and BMATs. Diesel for your engine rooms or your medfac or whatever else you need to fuel and the factories to make some supplies in case of emergency. Now, this is a very nice checklist, but of course, the final sentence there, rarely if ever will you get everything you want, work around it. Sometimes you don't have the seaport and you have to drive flatbeds and uh, use the depot. And sometimes you won't have a salvage mine nearby, but there will be a field. So we, uh, you will have to be farming the field and making MSOPs that way. Sometimes you have to build within RSC range. Sometimes you have to build down a hill instead of up a hill. Um, there's workarounds for everything, but the key to like bunker based design is actually to work around these limitations in creative ways and to accept imperfections. Sometimes you just don't get what you want and you know that your base has a vulnerability, but there's nothing you can do about it except stay vigilant. Questions about this? Um, what is RSC range? RSC is real storm cannon. <clears throat> I mean, like, what's the range though? Yeah, it's 500 plus meters. It says so on the <laughs> on the slide there. Um, the plus is again wind. Um, I don't know exactly how much additional range it gets with wind. I don't know if anybody here knows. I think 40, I think 50 it, meters. Yeah, it feels I think like it's it. Mm -hmm. What's that last one? I think it's plus 10. Plus, plus 10, 10 plus 15. Plus 10 plus 15 plus 20, depending on the tier. It's right, an right, aggregate right. of 5. I'm not yeah. sure if that's still correct. Or it's not that much, but it's good to keep in mind because I measured uh, to the defenses at Spit Rocks, it's exactly 500 meters. That means they can shell um, the outer range of the defenses that are there, but most of the base is um, safe. Anything else? Uh, what's the best way to measure? You mean distance? Yeah. Yeah, so anything further away than 125 meters, you can't bino. Um, you can measure with OBS bunkers, but that's very awkward because then you got to build one. And I think that's like up to 250 meters or something, 245. But this um, tool that I'm using here is foxholestats.com. It has a uh, measuring tape tool on the top left that I use to draw these red lines. And it tells you the azimuth and the distance. And it also uh, shows rapid decay zone so that you know exactly where that is. And you can also place uh, circles that you can use uh, at different, you can set it to different meters. And for example, Colonial Artillery is 250 meters, the wheeled one. Uh, so you can just place that circle and then measure that way how far they can shoot, for example. Does that make it clear? Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Moving on to 2B, uh, you'll notice the steps have 2A, 2B, and all that type of stuff in it. This is very important and something people often forget because when they're trying out a build or if they want to build a bunker base, they try and do it solo. Any actual like useful sized base has to be built with a crew. Single people cannot build these giant bases, and when people do that, they usually burn out for 10 wars of building uh, because they are just slaving away at that thing, and it's not fun. You want at least a couple of people to help you. Ideally, you gather a couple of people who are dedicated as much as you are to the base, and it helps if you ask them up front. Don't ask them the same day. Approach people via, via DM and be like, hey, dude, I want to build a nice base here or whatever. Do you want to co-build or co-design or co-run it with me? And you need like an empathetic yes, because if they disappear on you halfway through, that's going to suck for you. Uh, but it sucks even more for the fact that you've built this nice base and then it all has to decay and then somebody else has to come in and build and it'll be defenseless for a day or whatever. Just don't build bases alone. That's basically what I'm saying. Um, best thing to have is the support of the regiment. And what I usually do or did when I build these bunker bases is I pre-war plan it. So I, I make it part of pre-war planning. Usually at the end of a war and during resistance phase, we do a lot of planning. You can make a council ticket and you can be like, hey, I want to build a sizable base this war and I've got an XYZ person to help me or uh, do it with me. Do I have the support of the Reggie? And then they'll tell you how much support you get. Are you allowed to take MSOPs from our stockpiles? Are you allowed to take supplies? Can we make eats for you? That type of stuff. 
What also helps is to make, uh, like, whenever you do a milestone, such as digging your defenses or placing a lot of eats or whatever, just place, like, map markers or sit reps or pings for help in the server and then ask people to help. And I, the fourth bone I wrote is bursts of help, because that's for those majorly important moments where you need a big crew, which is digging the stuff out, uh, upgrading the stuff to tier two or concreting it or demoing friendly um, buildings that are in the way. Main benefit is to have plenty of supplies for your bunkers as well and QRF time zone coverage. It's nice if your build crew has time zone coverage, but usually you won't be awake like during the entire 24 hours. So it's nice if you can place the base in infra fact list and then people will know it's there and know to QRF it and know that it's our base. Biggest mistake you can make is to build this base and not tell anybody and then be mad when nobody helps out, right? Um, the best thing to do, in my opinion, is to gather like a group of friends or co-leads. You can become a infrastructure lead for the war and build one of these bases and having co-leads really helps. Uh, you can also do like individual messaging or group DM, which is what I did for Spitrocks this war. I've mainly been building and maintaining it with, a, with like four other people. Um, you get consistent help and they also have a feeling of ownership over the project because the bigger, biggest problem is... Um, Usually what people are willing to do is sporadic help. You'll be like, oh shit, I'm running low on MSUPs. Ping somebody and then they run the MSUPs. But what you actually want is somebody to help you out with these daily tasks and do the thinking for and with you uh, and not have to be... Um, but what I actually mean is that they are proactive instead of reactive to the needs of the base. Questions about this? Take a sip of water. All right. So, now onto the actual considerations that you need when you're designing this bunker base. Important for you to mentally map. I've mapped it out here on the right, but I mean, you don't really need to, need to have paint to map this out in your head. Uh, it's the attack vectors of the enemy. The dark green ones are main attack vectors, and the lime green ones are secondary attack vectors. How do you differentiate between the two? This war was a northeast versus southwest war, and Deadlands was a front line at the start. It's nice for me to build one hex back, but still close to the border base, because then you won't be stuck queued for the first week that you want to build your bunker base. Unless, of course, the region in front of you falls within a day, it happens. Uh, and then you consider the main areas of the attack, and the dark green arrows on the on the left, uh, the two of them that come from Deadlands, those are where the border bases spawn. So they will probably attack uh, in the shortest route to the relic base, because that's their main goal to get, right? They want the global spawn, they want, well, spit rocks to die. So those are the two main ones. I also built another, or I drew another um, uh, green arrow from the bottom, which is where the third border base could spawn if they take Drownville. So mainly, uh, attack vectors come from border bases, um, at least while the region, uh, or while your bunker base is close to the border of the region. Lime green ones are secondary routes, like it's possible that whenever they take Groundville, they also come from Lockheed, uh, and whenever they uh, take Deadlands and come from on one of the other two BBs, there is a small uh, hill that they can sneakily climb on foot or with a vehicle to also attack Spit Rocks. It's not along a road, which is why it's secondary, because most players don't think to go off-road, especially newer ones. Uh, and then the third one is if they flank all the way around via Marbon. It's unlikely that they take this flanking route and attack you, because um, if they try and take the, uh, that route instead of one of the green arrows, then you can cut off their push from there. So, unless it's a Ballista Rush, it usually doesn't happen that way. Um, there's also some main terrain assets to keep in mind when you are designing your bunker base. First of all is mountains. Uh, these are impassable and they provide some measure of cover from artillery since they can catch shells before they uh, hit their mark. Um, it's important to consider these because everything between mountains is a choke point. So to the northwest of the bunker base you can see that bleeding plateau, which is the area here, has a choke point. There's a choke point at this partisan route that I mentioned. There's a choke point between these two mountains. And if you cover off this, or like, there's only three choke points here, if you cover up, up all three, uh, you're basically covered from these enemy border bases here. And there's another, well, quote unquote choke. It's pretty wide, but between these two mountains and then these mountains at the back here. Um, important to keep in mind that uh, the sides of the mountains are usually fucky rocks. And what I mean by that is you have the actual mountain, which is a high up structure that they can't pass, but there's also smaller rocks at the edge of the mountain that can be climbed and can block AI and shit. 
So if you ever build defenses that are um, snug up to a mountain, uh, do note that you don't just need to point your defenses forward where the enemy can come from, but also along those rocks, because they can boost past it, or they can suppress a garrison and walk past it, so you need additional defenses there. Elevation differences, um, this is only uh, something you can see if you have the improved map mod or using a tool like Foxhole Stats or Warden Express. <clears throat> Important to note is that you need to space your defenses a little bit away from these elevation differences. And the reason you want to do that is if you put your defenses right on top of that hill, um, it negates the advantage or the height advantage that you would get since um, they don't have to shoot over the lip of the hill. They can just shoot from bottom of the hill. Uh, and what you want is you want them to be able to cross the, the apex of the incline. And when they cross the apex of the incline, they get immediately targeted by AI. Because that also means that um, their vehicles can only slowly climb up it. So if there's a ballista rush, for example, it'll slow down the ballistas, give your AT guns more time to shoot. And also, it's the main benefit of, of course, uh, arcing ammunition such as bone saws or lunares can be shot from up there uh, and get some extra range. Uh, more on this spacing later. There's also roads to consider. Roads, of course, are unbuildable except by building a gate over it or a trench under it. Um, that does mean that they are weak spots, uh, also because vehicles go very fast on it. So if you don't place gates, they can just boost a truck or, a, uh, or an Argonaut or a tank into your base and bypass all of your defenses, because despite the fact that they'll get shot once or twice by an AT gun, it will not disable their vehicle and they can just run past and your base will get fucked. It's also important to keep in mind because they uh, it's pretty fucky to get trenches on their roads. Um, so it's tricky to build around them. And they also have a little bit of extra collision um, on top of their visible model. So important to keep in mind these roads. Uh, it's very small that you can see it here, but I also listed world structures. Um, if you're building next to the bulwark, that's a world structure. If you're building next to like a dam, that's a structure or a bridge. Uh, in the case of spit rocks, the only things to really consider are the relic base itself and the mine. Um, those can't be removed and they have to be factored into your defensive um, design. Um, it's also a global spawn um, and they can block line of sight for defenses. So it's important to keep those in mind. Finally, not really an issue for spit rocks, but bodies of water, sheets of ice and beaches. Um, beaches can only be built using... Uh, tank traps and mines and barbed wire and those type of emplacements, same for the uh, ice flows, although the ice flows can also contain or be built, uh, sorry, pillboxes can be built on top of them. Uh, bodies of water, of course, you can't build anything on, but it's important to keep an eye on that because partisans like to go up beaches and cliffs and that type of stuff. Um, so if your base is ever next to a beach, do face some defenses that way. You don't need to do like... Uh, triple AT that you need to kill a ballista rush because barges are only so wide and can only fit so many ballistas. You need a few uh, few less uh, AT guns and probably some more rifle garrisons depending on how wide the beach is. Any questions about this? Uh, just as a comment, I was a, I'm planning on running a rather large project next war with help from a few other people, mm -hmm. and I was expecting I would have a lot of questions, but this has been very comprehensive. Thank you. Well, no problem. I like to do it. And again, the recording will be shared and everything. I'll share the slides too, so thank you. Next, step 3B, considering your environment again. This is, uh, this, the difference is now, except for major terrain assets, there's also minor terrain assets which block you from placing structures and will block line of sight for AI and are also invisible on the map. So the only really way to find them is by walking up to your build site and visibly or visually inspecting the site. Uh, they can be very tricky to build around. In towns you will have town assets such as stands, crates, barrels, uh, low walls. Um, these extend slightly underground. As you can tell, the model for the low wall in this image ends right there, but the trench can only fit there. And trenches usually have a slimmer model than uh, bunker squares or triangles even. So these are things that you need to build around. You cannot make trenches under these, so keep them in mind. There's also the fucky rocks I mentioned before. Um, these extend a little bit underground as well. You can't build on top of them. And like small gaps right here, this is where infantry can hide behind and shoot Lunaires from. Uh, Lunaires have unironically been terrible for Warden Builders because uh, they don't need direct line of sight to kill your stuff. So they can just shoot over these things. Very annoying. 
There's also happy little trees, which are the most fucked thing in the game, because their models don't fit either. They are usually like a little bit underground squares, but they are especially annoying for blocking line of sight and because they come in loads of loads of clusters, uh, which I'll show you in a second here. But there's other stuff like this looks like it would be able to fit, but there's an area obstructed. Um, sometimes this is t totally random. There can be small dips in the environment where you want it to build, which you only find out about once you're trying to lay your patterns. And you'll have to work around these, so very annoying. Um, as I said, this all requires underground scouting and smart blueprinting, and you have to consider these with your mental map of the area when you're trying to build. This is just an example of how trees, uh, the closer you build the garrison to the trees, the bigger the area that's blocked uh, for the AI to fire at, so very annoying. Uh, oh yeah, this was just something uh, of an example. This is southwest of Maidensville. You could look at this map and be like, shit, that's a nice open space to build a nice thick bunker wall to protect Maidensville. Except, uh-oh, loads of trees here that you have to build around, which is what the builders of Maidens actually did this war. You can tell from where the trees are on the map and where they've built that they had to build around them. Very annoying um, and can ruin lots of build projects. That's the minor assets. Any questions? Okay. Then, um, estimating your resources. Uh, as you can tell, the further we get into this presentation, the less animations I had time to add. Sorry for that. But um, yeah, there's, there's a couple things you gotta keep in mind before you decide on your build project. First of all, it's nearly impossible to calculate upfront what you will need. So most of this stuff is learned on the fly. Um, but there's a couple things you can keep in mind or prepare in a way uh, to deal with these problems. So first of all, BMATs, honestly, just guesstimate however you need. You're, you're going to need loads. It's probably smart that the, for the first few days that you're doing the build that you also just screw up a lot. Uh, you'll be waiting for tech for your bunker anyways. So I advise you to build up a nice stockpile of BMATs. Um, I think for the spit rock space this war, which eventually ended up costing over a thousand M subs an hour, I'm sure we went through at least two stockpiles of BMATs just to build the stuff, which is like 600 crates. Doesn't sound like a lot, except you mostly do not want to take from the regiment for this, especially since most of those BMATs are um, used in the early war, which is when there's a general BMAT shortage everywhere. So try and make most of the BMATs yourself. As for concrete, it is, it's important if we have a coal field that you make a deal with the facility lead that we get FMAT concrete first. And if it's a base that matters to the rest of the regiment, you can make a deal for it. Or you have to get a mixer and just get ready to sweat for comps. Uh, comps early war, of course, suck to get. And you want early concrete for your base, but you also want to balance out the faction's needs for early armat weaponry and such. And basically, my advice, if you are building on the the, the far midline or the far backline, don't concrete anything until like the, like the end of the first week or the end of the second week when like actual valuable stuff gets made in your facility or whatever, because people need those things for armats very badly. Um, you need some wire sandbags, and uh, you could also need C mats for small rail. Uh, I'll get I'll get into that later, uh, but you can just get those from any nearby mat fact. People usually don't care; they're so cheap. You can just ask them for it. Um, and it's also nice to have diesel and petrol for your uh, engine rooms, but your petrol for your uh, mat fact or salvage mine or whatever you're gonna build. Um, as to that point. Um, you do need to figure out your MSUP situation before the war or during war start. Um, you have to pick a location that's at least somewhat near a place where you can just make MSUPs. It helps if there's a public MSUP near factory or facility nearby and you talk to the builders of the facility, you'll be like, hey, I realize this is public MSUPs. I'm going to build a pretty big base. I'll try and like help out with the public M sub fact, of course, but I'll be taking a lot of this stuff. So please, are you guys okay with that? It's just nice and polite to do. Like despite it being public M subs, just joining and never contributing is pretty bad form. Um, you also have to consider the tech level of the VAR, but also of the bunker bases that you're building around. Because if you're building day one, you have to tech up everything yourself. Sometimes during the mid war, there's sleeper BBs or abandoned BBs that you can instead adopt. Um, so you have to work out whether you need to put mods in, uh, for example. Um, yeah, and it's also much easier to get manpower during the early war than it is to get it during the mid and late war, both in the regiment and outside it. Late war, people are just burnt out, and if, you, if, you're, if you're like, hey, I can no longer maintain this base, I need people to help me out, 
nobody's going to respond because everybody's got their own shit to do and it's it makes sense so try and get ahead of this early by asking for help as early as you can or getting people involved with the project oh yeah right i added this last minute neighbors um it's very important when you're building a big base that you are friends with your neighbors um try and work with them as much as possible they can be dick holes they can be noobs they can be new um but you need them for qrf reasons for sharing supplies and vehicles for using facilities what if you're offline and your shit catches on fire if you're friends with the neighbors they're gonna rush over and help you if they fucking hate your guts they're like haha burn so try and make friends um the final resource which is not the least important is time um you have to consider how much time you have to put in for the war if you know that in two weeks you got like a deadline at work or whatever don't try and build a giant base um it's bad form to like inject 32k m subs into something because you're going on holiday it, it just it doesn't make sense just try and consider these things um and also important to know <clears throat> how closely to the front line you are building sorry sip of water um because you can consider approximately how fast the enemy reaches your your base like during this war the the northeast southwest one uh, i decided to build on spit rocks which was only two sub hexes away from being taken at war start but if i were to build osterwall i could be a bit more chill with the effort required because i know i have a bit more time to tech up a bit more time to build defenses that type of stuff yes questions about this slide all right so um maintenance is a pretty important part of the base um the killer for bunker building is not the actual building which does take a lot of time but at least it's fun and it's a challenge and you get to design stuff the real killer is maintenance um which is an unfortunate reality of foxhole with the way that the servers work you can ignore all of this fucking math all you really need to know is that a single uh, matfec can make 2880 m subs per hour if you have 100 percent uptime so while you are playing it can make this many m subs an hour um, and you need to refuel your diesel generators for these matfecs every 30 minutes it could also be a petrol gen but i don't recommend it because petrol is harder to get um, so what this means is that if you're producing m subs actively while you're online uh, every 30 minutes you need to at least um, press the button on the diesel gen to keep the matfec going um, and it can be fed by a single mine um, if you have petrol in it. If you only have diesel in it, um, you can only run the MadFac a third efficiency, or what, what, what would I call it? The salvage mine would not keep up with the production of the MadFac. That's basically what I mean. So the limiting factor in MSUP production when the mine is petrol is actually the uptime of the diesel power plant. If you're just set there in the base running the MSUP, one mine can keep up with one MSUP FEC, outputting 2,880 MSUPs per hour. Now, if you take the example of Spit Rocks this war, it eats a thousand M subs an hour. So, as you can imagine, uh, if you can make almost 3k an hour, um, then you need to spend a third of your day, but I'll, I'll get to that in a minute, uh, actually doing the M sub stuff uh, once the build is up to uh, the thousand an hour level. I say let's pray that you have an oil field and refinery nearby because you're going to need constant diesel and petrol to upkeep the base and upkeep these matfex whether they are in your base or near your base you're as a builder if you build big you're going to be needing to run m sub facts you cannot just rely on for example fmet making crates of m subs for you but my pro tip um if i maintain my base i try and do it daily or if i have a small group of people uh, i hope that some one of us at least does it every single day i try and keep my m sub levels at at least 48 hour levels so i can skip a day um and in between these 30 minute runs where i have to go back to the diesel fact to press the button to refuel it uh i i refill fuel canisters i go get petrol from petrol fields i reload the guns i resupply the bbs i uh fill the engine rooms i scout and qrf uh, i try and do different things in between I, I don't like to just sit there and press the button every 30 minutes but some people do that during work for example but it's not fitting with my lifestyle my work so i can't do that uh questions about this yeah so key takeaway uh petrol your minds that's really it you're really shooting yourself in the foot if you don't keep it petrol 100 percent of the time uh, in case of emergency of course diesel can work but petrol is really important for this so uh wait sorry one question really yeah. quick uh so when it comes to some of the larger facilities assuming that you might just be bringing in a lot of scrap for other things is having your own msup production 
inside the base. Like, is that normally a, a bad idea, a good idea? Like, relatively, how often would you recommend doing something like that? Like, what would be the I, deciding factor between producing m subs in the base versus not? It's really proximity. Like, um, if the mines or the field, the salvage field, you can also have a salvage field inside of your base. It's, it's a bit big to build, but if those are inside of your base, uh, then you are responsible for the public MSOP fact that it is. I r highly advise against making it private. Uh, because we made it public this war, actually, funny story, there's two people at Spit Rocks, two Russian guys who are online like 10 hours a day, who just keep running this thing for us. Um, that's because we made it publicly accessible. If you were to squad lock it or whatever, um, you're going to end up with trouble. Um, it's... Uh, important to note that these mad facts always have to be right next to the mine or right next to the field because transporting raw salvage into your base to then use that mad fact is very inefficient because the transport efficiency for um, the actual MSOPs themselves is much higher than the transport efficiency of the salvage. So you'll be doing a lot of useless runs if you don't produce locally at the field or at the mine. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, thank you. Okay. So now for an example, uh, the Spit Rocks base, which I've talked about a couple of times now. This is the current state of the Spit Rocks base. Um, I'll explain this image first, and then I'll go over the text. What it is, is it shows the total amount of MSOPs per hour, which is uh, around 1,000. Um, I have four tunnels in the base that I am maintaining uh, in order to reach all of the defenses, which are all within 100 meters range of these tunnels. Uh, the red numbers is the usage per hour, the... Black number is the usage per hour times 24 rounded up by a thousand. Um, so that's 5k for the top right tunnel, that's 8k for the top left or the bottom left, etc. etc. Uh, these black numbers are 24 hour levels, so you know that you can go to bed and the base will be there in the morning, um, given um, you know um, uh, decay free time for newly placed buildings. So if somebody builds random shit during the night, uh, it won't kill your MSOP modifier as long as you can get it deleted before the uh, decay kicks in and the green number is 48 hours which is the comfortable level that i can go to uh, go to sleep easily on um it looks like a lot but this single uh, uh the same single msop fact that i have next to the mine uh, apparently it's being used at least 8.3 hours a day because i've been living off this thing for like two weeks now um, not having to import any msops which is also partly due to those two russians that i mentioned but also due to the efforts of the uh, small build team which I'll actually name them. Um, it's mostly been Natasi and Sammy and um, myself. Uh, um, Quinny has helped out, and now I'm forgetting somebody very important. Who am I forgetting? Hi. Oh, oh Randy. Randy. Hello. Yes, yes, Randy. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You're also forgetting someone else. And Geert. And Geert, and Geert, yes, yes. Sorry. Yeah, that's it. I blanked because I'm giving a presentation, but yes, those guys have been a great, great, great help. Um... Yes, so the example. Um, MSOP usage always varies based off of uh, decay-free timers. Like every time you upgrade something from tier 1 to tier 2, there's a couple hours where you are decay-free. The same goes for concrete. The same goes for newly built stuff. Uh, but we've pretty much reached the apex now because we're not adding anything to the base or changing anything about the base at this point. Uh, we are in a very poor region. I think we would have been very poor just off of our build, but there's a couple other builds in our subhex, like uh, Chimpaste to the northwest and a couple others here. <clears throat> We're using the single Matfax single mine. There's a petrol field one hex over. There's a refinery within our hex. Um, so it's pretty ideal conditions, and it's going through about 24,000 MSOPs a day. Um, but the output of the the theoretical output of the mine is like 69,000 MSOPs a day if we had full uptime. Uh, so that means that 8.33 hours a day have to be uh, the MSOP fax has to be ran. You can alleviate your MSOP pain if you ever find yourself in a position where you've bit off more than you can chew. Um, uh, through a couple ways, you can increase production of MSOPs by importing from FMAT stockpiles, with permission from the council, of course. Um, you can go to a salvage field and scoop there for yourself, instead of just relying on the mine. <clears throat> or you can use some of the other mines in the region, which is what we did at War Start in Lockheed, although that got taken pretty quickly. Um, manpower, you can add more manpower to the build or, you know, have more people helping out because this 8.33 hours a day of running the setup solo, uh, if you have two people, it's only four hours. If you have five people, it's only an hour and a half per person. If you have 10 people, it's only 50 minutes a day. And you can also reduce your structure count, like getting rid of trenches that you no longer need or, uh, you know, simply build smaller, which is not always like really viable or possible, but 
Technically, this could have been built smaller if I just built the fences like this or whatever. But then they could have been up on this hill fighting, which I don't like. So, From this um, example, you can extrapolate. Because if you know your available resources, manpower, and modifier, you can decide how much M sub an hour you can take. What I mean by that is 1,000 M subs an hour uh, with this setup that I have takes 8.33 hours a day. If I had a second mine and a second M, uh, M sub fac, it would be halved. And if I... Um, Instead, had more manpower, it could also be reduced, and etc., uh, etc. Et and oh, right, yeah, the the per tunnel usage is important to measure from time to time so that you know what to expect over the coming 24 hours, because tunnels are um, their 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 modifiers fixed for 24 hours at least. And the buffering that I mentioned is the green numbers, like the 48 hour ones. It's good for your mental health if you have a bit of a buffer, so you don't feel obligated to log in every single day. That's the example. Any questions about it? Yeah, quick question, uh, Benchu. Mm -hmm. um, what does the region modifier does to the MSAPs? How many percent does it uh, change it change the MSAP uh, consumption? Good question. Any idea? Yeah, good question. So there's four stages of MSAP modifier. You have uh, I don't know. I don't know actual fucking names. Very good. You good, have very good. You have good. What's the other good, two? very, uh, very poor, good, good, poor, and very poor. There you go, poor and very poor. Um, if you are very good, you only need to pay half the MSOP cost of whatever you've built, because every single entity that you build is a single MSOP, uh, except for uh, facility stuff, which all have their own values, which is real fucky. Um, but in bunker building, usually all entities are <clears throat> one, including tripods and shit. Um, uh, so that's the the good modifier. It's a it's an MSOP modifier of one, so it all costs what you would expect. If it goes to poor, it's times two cost. If it goes to very poor, it's times four. And I still don't know if it infinitely skills or if it just stops at time four. Does anybody here know? It stops at times four. Very poor is the worst. Okay, there you go. Well, that's the worst you can get. Um, but if you're building okay. a reasonably sized base, just you know, uh, be prepared to pay the very poor cost. Uh, additional question: Does it reflect on the tunnels? You know how many MSAs it accumulate, uh, consume. Does it reflect on what? The, the, does the additional modifier uh, reflects on the tunnels? You know, if, for example, if you check on the tunnels, you can see how many MSAs it consumes per hour, right? Are you saying does, time, time so, nodes? I don't, I don't understand that word that you're saying. Tunnels, I think. Uh, when you show like, how many amps up you're using per hour, is that show the yes. affected? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You need to drive up to the tunnels, and there will be a tooltip on the top. Actually, hold on. If you go to this tunnel right here, uh, and you hover over this amps up symbol here, it says maintenance status. It gives you a couple yeah. things of information. It potentially supplies 334 structures, <clears throat> but because there are other tunnels nearby maintaining some of those structures, it's only consumed 217 over the past hour. Uh, and the modifier updates any tw every 24 hours. This is actually important knowledge. If the MSOP modifier for your region changes for whatever reason, like from very poor to poor, because there's a base nearby that's died or whatever, immediately go yeah. to all of your tunnels uh, and like adjust the slider like this and then put it back to the number that you want it at because that will lock down the modifier update at the bottom there to 24 hours. So you can just... Um, like this also works the other way around so while your tunnels are still at good for example uh, do the same thing before you log off and then if during the night the modifier turns to poor or very poor you'll have this 24 hour period where it's still good does that make sense oh okay yeah so that's the reason why like this suddenly increase its uh M sub. okay got yeah. it. I, need to adjust <laughs> it. I need to adjust the slider okay got it yeah, and whenever you adjust the slider, it takes on the current modifier that it that is in the subregion. So that's important to know. Good question. Anything else? I feel like for Gore, since like the M sub change, like the town halls and relics take priority still, or ooh, I think tunnels take priority these days, not bases. But I'm not a hundred percent confident about that answer. Sorry. The relic is bigger. The range of it. Yeah, the, the range is bigger, but I think uh, the, the mm -hmm. thing that's uh, closest? I actually don't know. Sorry, I don't. Okay, continuing. Um, 
And the reason why I took you through all of this first before explaining patterns and shit is just because, again, uh, MSOP is the real mind killer. So keep all of this stuff in mind before you decide to go mega big with your project. Then we finally come to initializing the actual build. Um, the Sentence at the bottom is the one I'm gonna, actually going to start with. Warden Express and Paint are your best friends. Uh, Warden Express has tools for measuring AI range for the static bases. It has tools for uh, measuring, uh, for example, how far artillery can shoot. Voxelstats.com lets you place custom 80 or 100 or 120 or 500 meter circles, which can also be very helpful. And I use Paint to plan out most of my builds just globally, because as you can tell from uh, the top right image, that was the original uh, plan for what we were going to build, and we decided to forego the northwestmost lines to draw them a bit closer to the relic eventually. And the reason for that is just to limit the MSOP cost of the build because we were with a smaller crew. But let's go uh, from top to bottom. So, picking a location, um, your preference again is always to build around static bases if there's still space. Because uh, it gives how our zero AI, so from the moment the war starts, it has AI. It also has a bunch of supplies in it to QRF with. It has radios, it has diesel, it has shirts and everything. So uh, it, it helps prevent you from having to supply all that stuff. It is also a global spawn for QRF. Um, it's always uh, supposed to be a, a, a global spawn as long as the... Uh, it's, this, it's, this, it's this archaic system where as long as the, the, the garrison is active or whatever the fuck. I don't know how to explain that, but... Just trust me, it has a global spawn, and it has an increased AI range, and it's also pretty tanky. Uh, tankier than your tier 1 or tier 2 BB that you're going to build at first. So that's why you want to build around these static bases. Uh, and also, of course, they are a key defensive position, or a critical defensive position. Um, I do want to mention here that these critical defensive positions, for example, Spit Rocks during this war, which was right on the front line, uh, I prefer if it all gets built by expert builders, but sometimes, you know, there's nobody building there. So then, of course, it's better for somebody to build there than nobody. Uh, but it does require a lot of time investment and sufficient manpower to run as well. So that's why you don't want these spots to be given or taken by groups who are just going to abandon it in two weeks, right? Um, also, uh, consider downsizing your build and plans in accordance with your expectations. Originally, my plan for this build was to also build down these slopes right here. Uh, but that was just way too much work for the group that I had, so I chose instead to limit myself to the upper echelons of this base, which does mean it left an area open for partisans to walk this way, for example, but, I mean, what can you do? You can't do everything yourself. Um, so these front and midline spots need to be claimed and minimally built day one, and by minimally built, I mean at least a couple pillboxes or whatever to defend the blueprints that you have, and also the bunker base themselves, which need to tech up. Uh, it's also nice to claim these bunker bases in the 30 minutes before war start uh, on WE, or at least as soon as you can. Uh, just mark an area and say, I'm running this base, contact me or whatever on Warden Express. Uh, backline spots can be done at a much slower pace, but be mindful of the first thing I told you guys. Uh, every single base needs to fulfill a need. Don't just build random LARP bases in the middle of nowhere. That's the first step. Um... Then you have to bring the tools that you're going to need to build these bunker bases. Um, very short overview. Uh, the E stands for early war. Early war, you're going you're gonna to need to bring a DUN to transport your BMATs and stuff in. You're going to need to build a CV at a static base and bring it over. You're going to need shovels, which need production in the factory because they appear nowhere in the game um, at war start. You have to produce them in a the factory and then bring them over. It's also nice to bring some radios, guns, ammo, stickies, and shirts just for basic QRF while you are building uh, or you know when you're sleeping after the first day. During the mid and late war, you get some quality of life. You can get a knut, which is uh, something that can uh, tow a trailer with concrete and stuff, but it also, it's also pretty fast off-road when you're building. ACVs help you build up tier 2 stuff and pillboxes much faster. And a critical tool for building is binos. Um, I forgot to put it in the sheets, but at war start, the way that you can tell how far, for example, the AI of your bunker base will... Uh, will reach is you blueprint the entire bunker base core you remove the square that, that's going to be the core itself and you build a watchtower in its spot and if you have a radio you wait a couple seconds and on your map you will see a, an exact circle uh, of intel range which is also going to be the circle that the ai of the bunker base reaches so that's a neat little trick but you don't need that if you have binos because if you have binos you can just stand in the spot where the core will be and zoom around the 80 meter, 80 meter uh, range and see exactly how far 
um, your patterns can go, your AI can go. It's important that um, you guard your build side. Um, guarding, uh, first of all, means Intel coverage. So I would recommend not building the core until you have at least decent watchtower coverage. That doesn't mean your direct area. That also means like at least 100 meters around your build site so that you can spot people coming from far away. Um, during the early war, the only thing you can really build as extra or additional defenses without bunker-based tech is rifle pillboxes. So you can just spam that in a 360 circle. During the mid-war, you can swap those out or interchange them with uh, MGs. And during the late war, you want a AT, MG, and rifle pillbox line uh, like the center image. You can point the MGs a little bit out and space your AT pillbox a little bit more forward. Uh, this will the, the coverage of these two, gar uh, I was going to say garrisons, pillboxes crosses in front of the AT pillbox. But the AT pillbox, um, or sorry, the MG Pillboxes won't be clapped by tanks easily because they have to get in range of the AT pillbox. That's a nice way to build in a circle around whatever the area is that you want to build your actual bunker and patterns. Uh, this keeps you safe, but more importantly, uh, when you're laying down blueprints, um, sometimes it can get pretty tricky with like cursed corner tech and whatever. And you don't want the blueprints to just be deleted by a colonial running up and shooting your blueprints because then you have to do it all over again while you have just measured everything out nicely. You also have to think of what type of core you want to build. If the base that you are building is just going to be a frontline base uh, or something that's very near the enemy, a bow tie is fine. You can just build this and make the squares on the end like ramps or rifle garrisons or whatever the fuck you want to do. For concrete cores, there are three that I recommend. Um, the turtle, um, it does have four red squares, but these no longer mean four howies. I recommend two howies max uh, due to the integrity nerf that was um, included in this update. Um, the other two squares can be ramps. Um, the snail is pretty compact, more compact than the turtle. And a very strong one is the octa core, which is also what I've built here at Spit Rocks. Um, two howies on it, as I can tell, but the uh, eight blank pieces give it a lot of health to tank uh, enemy artillery with, so that's pretty nice. Um, I do say I make an exception for any bunker cores that are built near water. Because as I told you before, battleships are very bullshit. Um, and they're just you're, you're going to need the retaliation of at least two guns on that ship in order to get them to spring leaks and shit. And it will mean that your core uh, goes down faster. But um, the, real, the real key of deterring enemy destroyers or battleships is to uh, attack them with as much shit at, um, at once if they do trigger your Howies. So... That's really an exception that I make. And I make the same exception for patterns that are near the water. I usually say don't include more than one Howie on your patterns. But if you're near the water, probably going to want two at least. Questions about this? All right. Then. Oh, um, question, BG. Sorry, I was muted. Um, what's the Howie nerf? Um, so it used to be, uh, um, well, this is this goes into the territory of basic builder knowledge, but basically howitzers tank the integrity of whatever you attach them to by a lot. And with the current update, it's, it got twice as bad. So um, adding too many howies to your piece is going to make them weaker. That's the basics of it. Okay. By what percent? Uh, that depends. It's, it's basic builder knowledge. I'm not going to go into it for this trading. Um, okay, got it. So for the third step of initializing the build, um, the placement of your cores and initial defenses is key and very hard to change. What I mean by that is cores cannot be removed by yourself or wardens uh, if they're older than three hours. Um, there is some niche situations where you can go around it, but basically try and place your cores in the right spot the first time so you don't have to bother. So where would you place your cores? Um, First thing to consider is your AI buffer zones. And what I mean by that, this is basically, it's a stretch of land in front of your AI garrisons that's a killing field. And preferably, this killing field has no obstructions and the firing angles of the different patterns cover each other nicely and you get a nice spread of AT and MG coverage. A good rule of thumb is that you want at least 40 meters of area in front of your pieces that is unbuilt by anything in unobstructed line of sight. Uh, this is nearly impossible to get in uh, certain locations in the game, um, but it's uh, important to also account for elevation differences, line of sight, and firing angles when playing these zones out. For the Spitrock space, this is what it looked like. Um, 
to the top left here, this is just flat ground. There's a 40 meter, meter area that I want uh, defenses to be behind. They can also run up these slopes with the partisan route. So I want a small killing field there. And these are the big slopes. These are the most important, which is where most attacks come from. And then to the northeast, it's flat land again. Um, and it's a bit hard to explain, but you want to basically uh, place your garrisons, your MG garrisons and your AT garrisons about 40 meters away from this edge. Uh, also so that you have room for octagons with EATs in them in front. Um, your bunker bases basically go inside of these buffered areas somewhere, um, but the AI needs to reach right up to this area. So for uh, Spitrox, the AI area looks like this. Do note, foxelstats.com has the wrong circles uh, uh, in its tool. For foxelstats.com, the circle is much bigger, but Warden Express has the correct distance. So as you can tell, I could build garrisons right up to this circle and still be safe. Um, and I also need to, uh, uh, you, you will also notice that it overlaps with the buffer zones that I had uh, created. So for your initial build, when we were discussing protecting your build site in this slide, what I meant by placing the pillboxes, you place them inside of these red zones. The reason you do that is because then you can build your patterns or blueprint your patterns behind there and build right up to that zone. And then in front of it will be pillboxes to defend the blueprints, which is very nice. Uh, you'll be easily able to decay or destroy them <clears throat> by just limiting the range of your tunnels to the eventual patterns that you're actually gonna build. And then your um, your pillboxes in front will just die, which is very nice. So you don't have to mem in them and get friendly fire locked and that type of stuff. So first thing you do is you place your cores if there is no AI coverage present from a static base. If you do have the static base, you can place your BBs pretty far back from your outer defenses. Uh, for example, um, if I really wanted to, I could build a single core right here and I could tech trench. So I could build a lot of trenches like all the way over there, over there. Well, not up this hill actually, but all the way over there, all the way over there. Um, you don't need to build a BB here close within the 80 meter range because the relic base will provide AI anyways. So you can just build it in a safer spot and have lots more rooms for actual patterns uh, and not have to be have a core be in the way. Um, yeah, and I, I did need to build another core up here because um, the tech trench is impossible over this road and hill combo, which is very annoying. I At the war start, I had one built here, but then I, we decided to downsize, so I deleted this core through a lot of effort. Um, and eventually what we ended up with is, if you look on the map, um, three cores, one up here, which has nearly all tech except for deployment and advanced bunkers. And then I have a central one here, which has provided the tech for all of these defenses. And then one on the southeast, which has provided tech for the southeast defenses. Um, let's see. Yeah, if you have no static base like this, uh, sad days for you. But then you need to plan the placement of your cores as such that the AI barely reaches the AI buffer zone, but doesn't cross into it. And you can plan this using voxelstats.com. And initially, a novice builder might look at Bleeding Plateau, which is the area to the northwest right here. And think, okay, I'm going to build two BBs like across the road and I'll have coverage for this hill, I'll have coverage for this hill, and I'll have coverage for any attackers coming from the southeast. However, something that most new builders don't consider is that it's actually a lot smarter to build your BB or your second BB a bit further away from the first one. Not only to prevent, for example, artillery spread from hitting both at once, but also because this little gap right here... Um, if you're going to leave this AI gap, you're going to have to build your defenses like this. You're going to have to build a much bigger uh, or more expansive line than if you had just covered this with AI and you could just build a wall like this, like a straight wall, because you want your, you want, oh, you also want to minimize the amount of patterns that you need to build and amount of ends that you need to tank to defend an area properly. And this way you still have the same coverage for both of the hills. Any questions about this? Right. Um, I think it's good uh, right now if we take like a five minute break because I've been talking for a long time and I can imagine people want to go to the toilet or get some water. Um, so it's now 17 past the hour. Let's continue at 22 past. OK. I'm back. I just want people to have like a small break for a toilet break or water or whatever. I'm back. I'm beast. Yeah, I'll be continuing oh, uh... the presentation in a minute. <clears throat> Uh, da Vinci, quick question. Mm -hmm. So, for example, your build is like in Spitrox, right? Yeah. What 
what would happen if, for example, that speed rock is already like too far from the front? Do you let your base die? Oh, you mean like or, if you were to... Oh, sorry. Ah, it's, it's, for example, it, you know, the front moves a bit forward, you're pushing. So I th I'm saying that maybe your base is going to be irrelevant now. Do you de let it decay and then build, build a little bit uh, forward? Or do you just maintain that base? It's a tough question. It really depends. Um, let's say, let's say, like it's it's uh, the front's moved up like two hexes, right? That's about the midpoint of where I would be uh, in doubt. Because if the if the front's still closer than a than a hex or a hex and a half, I would keep everything up because you never know how fast the hex will fall. If it's two hexes, I start to doubt. But if I reach two and a half, three hexes behind the front line, I would definitely start decaying stuff. Um, but at the point of doubt, you have to decide for yourself how much effort it is for you to do this stuff, how many people are still running the base, etc., etc. But basically what you can do is you can start by decaying your outer trenches, uh, which is the stuff like um, the octagon trenches or whatever those things, right? You can just start decaying those. Uh, you could even get really weird with it and decay all of your, um, your trenches that aren't being used for piping power. Uh, you could definitely remove all of the emplacements and place them into storage. That can already save you like 20-25% on your MSOP input. The tough part is, um, whenever you make concrete, it's such a huge fucking effort to get concrete going and dry and all that type of stuff. Um, I would definitely try and save all of it until the front is like three axes forward you know what i mean like at that point i would just let it all decay and save the cores um the cores are the most important part those take the longest to build and shit like if need be if i had the entire base decay except for the cores which you can do by placing a tunnel next to it and limiting the range um worst comes to worst uh they push back again towards that two hex hex and a half like doubting zone if you know what i mean at that point you can just start rebuilding and you have plenty of time to rebuild your defenses and it's really, it's really about that. What you want to prevent is that you're letting stuff decay where the enemy can reach it uh, faster than you can rebuild it. And that's a bit of a tricky assessment to make. Let's put it that way. Yeah, okay. Got it. All right. So continuing the presentation, hope everybody's here, had their little sippy sip and et cetera, et cetera. So um, you've considered the AI buffer zones. You've placed your cores in a location that's favorable. Um Oh yeah, uh, I can show you how that went for, like all of these steps went for us. Um, this is Spitrocks day one. Every single garrison that you see here was simple pillboxes or one by threes. I built these one by threes, but in hindsight, I think we could have just gotten away with pillboxes because one by threes take a lot more effort to destroy afterwards. But I built them as much as possible in the buffer zones that we weren't going to be building into. Um, yeah, now for the next step. Knowing your enemy. Um, this is to do with building defenses for the most part, but there is a lot of, or there are a lot of tools in the colonial arsenal and you need to know them all and you need to prepare your defenses to be able to counter all of them. Um, hot tip, you're never going to be able to counter all of them, but you can do, definitely try your best. There's a couple things in the colonial arsenal. Uh, for the early war, you only have to think of mammons, flame tankettes, uh, ISGs and fissuras, which are the emplaced um, grenade launcher and lunares. Biggest danger is lunares. They, according to the wiki, have a 31 meter range, but even with slight elevation and a little bit of fuckery, it can reach up to 40. Uh, hence the 40 meter buffer zone that I mentioned, also because the ISG can shoot 40 meters. Um, the lunares, they can also slide across the ground a few extra meters. Yeah, exactly. But I think the theoretical max is, is, is 40. That's what I've been told. I, I've never actually checked myself, but yeah. Um, Midwar, they unlock ballistas, which eat concrete. These are terrible, and it's the main reason why these days wardens try to build patterns with three AT guns on them, whenever they can get away with it. <clears throat> very, very strong, and usually the main way to deal with concrete. Tanks can also kill concrete and your defenses. They can shoot up to 40 meters. Destroyers have a 200 meter range. Corona, yes, that's the field gun, um, has a 250 plus range. Anything that's already gets a plus due to wind. And late R you have the battleships, the thunderbolts, the RSCs, the SCs, and the nukes. You can't realistically defend against a nuke except by killing the enemy nuke. The SC, 
I don't like engaging in SC duels, but sometimes you have a base in a critical position and it's your responsibility to build storm cannons in order to counter theirs. Uh, RSCs are hard to counter, but again, with good scouting, you can probably get it down. Um, Thunderbolts are a little dangerous in a sense that they... Um, sorry, sip. That they have 50 more meters range than our own 150 and 120 guns. So if you have a defensive arty position, you won't be able to target their Thunderbolts if the enemy knows what they are doing. But of course, that's where howitzers come in clutch. That's why you build plenty of howitzers. Um, example, in the early war, flame tankettes, why are they dangerous? Um, it's because like handheld flamethrowers are pretty piss weak, but anything that's on a vehicle, like the flame tankette or the flame tank later on, um, can set uh, even concrete on fire pretty quickly. And if nobody QRFs, it just dies. That's just the way the fire works. Um, that's why you need good ops coverage, good intel coverage, and to be friends with your neighbors, so that if this does happen, people notice and they help out your base. Lunaires is an example of the bullshit they can do. Uh, the right-hand side is a cliff, the left-hand side is the relic base of the Spit Rocks. This is the, um, hold on, this is the northwest part of the base. The image is from shooting from here to here. They can definitely reach that with a Lunaire, and there's nothing you can do about it. You can't build defenses down the hill here, so you have to build up this hill and prevent them from reaching this spot in the first place. Ships. Um, we all know their pain. Uh, they can shoot pretty far. They are highly, highly, highly accurate. Um, so that means that you need a good howitzer density, preferably as close as possible as you can get them to your patterns. And this was the artillery I talked about, the one that shoots the furthest um, out of the regular artillery in the game. Questions about this arsenal? Did I forget anything, by the way? I don't think so. Oh, Havocs. Right, I did forget about Havocs. Uh, they are the premier um, infantry anti-structure tool. But if you have MG coverage and barbed wire in front, it's pretty hard for them to pull off a rush. Um, if you do not have the right firing angles and if you do not use MG garrisons for your main patterns, uh, there are situations where if they are wearing a recon uniform, they can... We'll get to this in a minute, actually, but they can run right up to your pattern. They can pre-place a bunch of Havocs far enough apart that they don't trigger each other. And then they can just shoot three times at the different Havocs and your entire pattern goes poof in like a second. And QRF will be like, what the fuck happened? Um, which is actually what happened two days ago, or yesterday, to a line that was here. Like this bunker base had a whole second line. They stacked Havocs during low pop and then blew it all up without QRF being able to do anything. So that sucked. <clears throat> Do note, you, you cannot defend against every single, single thing. There are some favorite colonial tactics to guard against, um, namely, but this is also something that Wardens do, of course, but low pop PvE, where they just run those Havocs, those Lunaris, those, fl those Flame Tech Cats and Spathas, and they bank on low QRF count, and they just shoot your shit uh, within intel range and with all the kinds of warnings and that type of stuff. They can also Argonaut or Tank Rush over weak spots. This is the southeast of Spit Rock Space, next to one of those fucky rocks. Um, during the night, if they have a Karneska, they could definitely boost, uh, boost past the first AT gun and be perfectly fine. Hence why I placed the second AT gun in their way. Um, I'm banking on it disabling them in time, but honestly, like, you could build infinite amount of AT guns here and then, you know, like, be sure of the kill, but I feel like this is enough. At least for the way that they have to go uphill as well. If, yeah, go ahead. If you're, in, if you're in battleship range, would you put more than one Howie on yep. your pattern? Since Def they're so yeah. accurate. Definitely, yeah. but we'll get, it to, we'll get to that in a second. But good question. Um, there's uh, also... Uh, yeah? yeah. Tell me. Uh, mountain Goat Ballistas. Yeah, Mountain Goat Ballistas, same thing. If, if there's a, a big hill where they're not supposed to get vehicles on top of, it's sometimes still possible. So just mind your cliffs, build far enough away from them. The 40 meters should be plenty. Um, another neat trick is them killing gates without retaliation because gates normally block these types of rushes that you see here over the road um but as you can see this person forgot to power their garrisons and so they can just sit outside of ai range at night and shoot the gate and then boost past it anyways and they will likely only get shot once or twice and not be disabled um rcs scs and nukes in other regions the only thing you can really do there is keep up your intel game be aware of where the enemy is and what they're building up uh, of course, there's large ships as well. Um, garrisons, even such as these that are powered, can be suppressed. If partisans run up with a machine gun, they can shoot at this thing and suppress the garrison and walk past it. That's why I have a second rifle garrison here. And if this, if you have like important shit in your base, like um, SHTs or SCs or whatever, I would recommend building defenses in a cage around those, even if they are inside of your own base. 
just to prevent the suppression and smoke bullshit and, sh and shit and buy uh, time for QRF to arrive. Uh, a new thing, which I noticed only after we had built this pit rock space, it's not actually new, but I didn't know this before, is that the emplacements that you place in front of your garrisons can block the line of fire of the garrisons. So this current location that I'm standing in, yeah, they can. So this current location that I'm standing in, um, because they come from downhill in front of spit rocks, uh, the MG cannot angle uh, low enough and not be blocked by the EAT to fire, so they can actually walk right up, which sucks. Um, but yeah, then they do have to move past the AT at some point, like right here when they walk past or whatever, and they still get shot, but it's something to keep in mind. I don't know if this happens for Starbreakers and EMGs, but I definitely know it happens for EATs. So be mindful of that. Right, uh, questions? The Would you have put the... It's like more... Yeah. To the sides, then, if you knew? Yeah, or like, how would you... with our base, um, if I were to rebuild it, I would move everything back slightly mm. um, so that you don't have to deal with the lip of the... Because the octagons are actually right here, like, hugging the hill. We should have definitely placed this further back, but I fucked up placing this core way too close, so there was no space for proper patterns. But yeah, mm -hmm. lessons learned. Okay, then we have arrived at the final step of bunker base design theory um which is the longest one and the most expansive um, which is what do you actually build what patterns how do you build them etc etc um, if you're building a tier 2 base because the enemy is close like within the same region or uh, you don't really have the tech to build up and it's late war where fronts can go pretty fast and every single base in front of you doesn't have proper tech has no at tech or whatever you can just build tier 2 shit and the best thing to do is spam halberds because the halberd is the best pattern uh at tier 2 it has two at guns um Aspatha will still chew through this but it's the best thing we have at tier 2 like late war tier 2 is worthless but you know it at least slows them down <clears throat> so if you want to protect your base while it takes concrete or whatever uh, spamming halberds is nice preferably a double line um and the reason a halberd is good, and most of these tier 2 patterns that you see are good, is because they can be rebuilt very fast. Um, they have uh, the maximum uh, garrison count in order to not have decreased health from integrity. Um, and you can cover multiple angles with them. Um, two AT guns are preferred, although the only pattern that can properly do it at tier 2 is the halberd. Uh, five garrisons max per piece and 11 pieces max, or you're going to lose health uh, when adding more stuff. Um, key to tier 2 is to intersperse a lot of trenches, pillboxes, mines, and EAT guns. Because the best thing for tier 2, and you're going to build it on the front line, so there's going to be people anyways, is just people manning the defenses. AI is actually not that strong at tier 2, especially late war. As for the tier 3 meta, there are many, 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 many options for patterns. Uh, there are a lot of planner tools that you can use, which are listed in our resources channel, such as Foxhole Planner, or like Spud has their own... Um, that I use because it has nice firing angles. But the, the, the rule of thumb for the current meta is that you want at least 20k health uh, in order to withstand ballista rushes. You want at least three AT guns to withstand ballista rushes. Uh, and you want MGs so that they can kill or retaliate against Lunaires because RGs actually do not reach far enough for them to shoot their Lunaire back off and then just not be targeted by retaliation. Uh, and they also don't shoot fast enough to kill. So, uh, in the current meta, um, I crossed out these uh, two back Howies, because we prefer one Howie per piece, because Howies really tank the health of whatever front pattern that you have, but you want at least one, uh, so that if the front does get cheesed, like, they could fire short, like, if they center their guns right here, then the spread of the shells will only reach here, and then the back Howie backpack that you want to add behind here will not get triggered at all, so you want at least one. And it's the same thing for mortars. If they mortar this piece down, if you have at least the one Howie, they, then you can easily kill the infantry that's shooting mortars. And this is the point that Natasi men mentioned, unless you are near water. If you are near water, you tank the integrity hit and you add more Howies, because battleships are very accurate. They can just aim here, and then the dispersion will be like this, max. And then the piece just dies if it only has one howitzer. So add more. I wouldn't go beyond three, to be honest, but... You know, like two at least. And we'll get into uh, tier three meta on the next slide. But are there questions so far? Yes. Why is the hallway facing one side more than the other? 
Why is um, that a lot different? Um, that's just due to the nature of the pattern. What they could have done here um, is add uh, the triangle piece and then just make the square face that way. But I mean, like, it's it's adjustable. The the the, the fun okay. part about these patterns is, especially at tier three, they're so big and so varied. You can just do things that you want to do with them. Like, if there is a uh, a mountain here that they can run past, you could add an additional AT gun here, or an additional RG gun here, or whatever. Um, the reason that these patterns are what they are is because they've been um, they've been designed with an ideal world in mind, but I mean, you can imagine that there could be a tree right here that's fucky that you gotta build around, and then the pattern will look ugly, but, you know, it'll still be plenty effective, so. Other questions? Okay. Alright. So, an example of the tier 3 meta, and I gotta thank Shredder of Fears um, for actually making this graphic, it's a very good one. This is an example of uh, two things. First of all, recommended tier three cores. As you can see, two Howies and these spots that would have Howies in the past uh, now have ramps. The reason you wanna replace every single blank square in your tier three meta with ramps is it doesn't increase health anymore. But what it does increase is the repair efficiency. So if you hit the piece once with a hammer and a beam at in your inventory, it'll repair a higher percentage of health if the piece okay. is a ramp. Which is actually Don't they change that. No, that's no, what... they, they took that out. It's the same repair rate as a blank square. Oh, is it? Yeah, then... they, okay, well they then. That out. I think it's just ten less concrete, concrete and you, you can't, can't put an engine room. It can't get griefed with an engine gr engine room. So. There you go. There you go. Still, still, good, still good rule, just a different reason. But yes, thank you. Um, so this is an example of in-depth defense. Um, random trees everywhere. Uh, the recommended trench design is as such. The connection of the front octagons that contain your emplacements to kill enemy tanks uh, should... I, I didn't do it for Spit Rocks this war, but they should be attached to your uh, MG garrisons because if an enemy gets inside of the trench, uh, the MG garrison can shoot down the trench and they won't be able to get inside of your pattern if you have a door there. Um, it's important to note you can only make these types of attachments while the pattern is still blueprinted. That's why I always say always blueprint everything first. Um, otherwise, if the pattern is already placed, you can only easily attach to the AT gun, and that's no use. Uh, a line of mines in front. I'll get to mine placement in a second. You want to build all of this stuff within AI range, hence this one. Um, you got to keep in mind your connections between the pieces. There is a gate which is placed um, a little further back back from the patterns that you might imagine. Some people might think of placing a gate right there, but you want your garrisons to be able to shoot, and you want it so that if they do run past these first two garrisons, they get shot at by, for example, this garrison right there, if they make it past the gate, which is also um, what it says here. The gate can be breached by a couple ballistas, so having extra AT coverage on your entrance and exit roads of your base is very good, and it also has a Howie on it for because it's a small piece, so the integrity hits not that much. Um, all of the patterns, I prefer connecting separate engine rooms for each pattern. I don't like to do blocks of engine rooms because if one of the blocks of engine rooms dies, then multiple patterns lose power. Um, and if the engine rooms are not connected, or the, sorry, the, the multiple patterns aren't connected to the same engine block, then it's modular defense in a sense. Every single MG rifle or AT garrison takes uh, one out of five slots that an engine room can provide power for, except if the engine room is connected to an OBS bunker. Um, please do not connect these ever to your defenses. Make it a separate two-pipe connection. Because um, if it's attached to a ops bunker, I think only one or two more garrisons can be powered off it. Which is strange, but that's the way it works. Don't forget your artillery pits, preferably with ammo rooms if you have the space for easy access and quick loading. Um, and these patterns can all be found in the uh, Better Builder Bureau Discord. Some of them require certain tech, such as Cursed Corner, uh, but we're not covering that during this training. There are a couple... Yeah, sorry, I forgot. This is when you build a line. And you can imagine this red line in here is mountains, like a choke point, or there's other defenses here, or whatever, right? But what if you have to build a 90 degree or a 45 degree corner, which sometimes happens? There's a couple special patterns for it. Um, this one uh, named the calf corner is actually called the scorpion, but people called it that because calf was one that promoted it heavily at the beginning. Uh, it has two AT guns facing um, both edges of the corner, or however the fuck you would call that, both directions of the corner. 
Um, this one also does that, but with only one AT gun, so it's weak to ballista. And the same goes for these types of patterns. It only has one that shoots this way, but you're banking on this middle one also shooting anything coming from that way. So these are 45 degree defense. The weakest part of any uh, meta concrete is always the quarter. Uh, you can't really do much about it, so I recommend not building 90 degree corners, but angling your patterns in such a way or building um, in a wide enough area where you don't need to do a corner piece. But sometimes, as with spit rocks, you have to deal with this 45 degree corner that's here. You can't really build patterns in a wider arc and then put them edge to edge. Um, so I had to use one of, the, one of the corner pieces, which uh, I can show after the training. But yeah, corners are weak spots for your base, so be mindful of them. There's a, a technique to placing mines. Um, I don't have to explain anything because it says so in the text. It's a great graphic, but basically you want the mines to be about 33.5 meters from your MG garrisons, because that way um, any enemies that want to wrench your mines have to come within the range of the MGG. And it'll still be 25 meters away with the current meta from your AT guns, and that's about the max range of a ballista. So basically these mines only exist to kill ballista rushes and as long as you have a mine force field at this current distance uh, in front of your garrisons, uh, ballista rushes are doomed to fail. So very nice, uh, but a dedicated enemy push can of course remove these mines and then you have to have active defense, but they're very good for low pop rushes. Um, right, and they say you can put an additional uh, line in front or behind because... Um, Hydra's Whisper can remove multiple mines at once, I think. Is that why they say this? I think so. Not sure, actually. But yeah. That's what it says in the text. Yeah, but it says, due to Kali's having access to Hydra's Whisper, but I don't know if the Hydra's Whisper oh, is for killing the, the mines or the pattern, but whatever. Hmm. Okay, so then I we get... Also, the, uh, to kind of widen the sweet spot, just in case, like, you know, things... Just, you know, so you can have a bit more... You know, just a little bit extra, like, space between you and a ballista, even if it's wrenchable. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Okay, so now we get to the actual blueprinting of the patterns. Um, there's a couple of rules of thumb that I'm going to go over. Uh, preferably, you don't want to do this, like, day or hour zero, or while you don't have at least rifle garrison or MG tech, because you won't be able to build it out. It'll just be blank pieces, which doesn't make sense. It only sucks M cost. It doesn't defend anything. So you have to wait until you at least have Rifle Garrison or MG Tech and it's able to stop infantry. Preferably AT and preferably even Conk if you can get away with it. Um, but if the enemy is close, of course, you don't have time to tech that. You have to build your patterns earlier than that. Um, reason for this is to save yourself from MSOP Hell uh, and also to be able to provide proper defense. Because a lot of the Tier 3 meta pieces that you're going to blueprint are only going to be uh, at good integrity or... Well, at least not critical integrity, if they are concrete. So that's why you want to wait for that. So then you select your patterns that fit in the location that you want, preferably patterns that have three AT guns on them, but sometimes you have to have two. As you can tell from the image, I only had space for one of those corner pieces and then one that has two, uh, but at least it has good MG coverage and it's a pretty tight line, so that's pretty nice. Um, I, I wrote here, know when it's too much, like... Uh, Given enough space, you can build an infinite amount of defenses in order to account for the first line falling or partisans sneaking by or suppressing garrisons or whatever. But at some point, you just got to decide for yourself uh, how big is this risk and how badly do we want to cover against it. And important to note that you blueprint everything before you start digging anything out, like I did here at the top. Um, you have to blueprint everything first because while these patterns are still blueprinted, you can build them much closer and tighter together. And once they are dug out, they will start blocking other blueprints. Um, so always, always, always blueprint, preferably your entire freaking base first, including ammo rooms, including engine rooms, including artillery pits, including your cores, like everything. If everything is blueprinted, you can, be, you can rest assured that it fits. And then it's a tight fit, and you want a tight fit in order for your Howie backpacks to be able to fire, uh, to maximize the space that you're using, etc., etc. And benches for power, very important. Sorry? Benches to carry power. Yeah, 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 he says this because <laughs> if you look closely at this design, <laughs> I didn't actually allow a lot of space to, for example, like my engine rooms are down here, like across the road, but I didn't actually trench towards this piece. 
so it's not connected to uh to really any engine room so i had to power it from the west here which was a very dumb mistake but that's also why i say here if you have everything blueprinted count back from your furthest uh garrisons uh to your engine rooms and it can only be a maximum of 20 connections and every trench every bunker piece is one connection like if you transfer a pipe from a trench to a bunker piece that's one connection so keep that in mind power only reaches 20 connections far uh, and 40 connections for tech to your bunker base so that's a bit more um, but yeah you do want tech to be able to reach the furthest edges um, otherwise you're stuck with a piece that you can put a garrison on which of course is fucked um, I wanted to place a different pattern here uh, at first um, you actually cannot really tell from this shot in game. Let me see if I can show it. There's a tree right there. And I had a pattern in mind at first that was actually better than this one, but I had to have a pattern with a gap right there. So that's what I mean by work around the obstructions. There's never going to be zero obstructions in a place that you want to build, especially trees. Just try and leave gaps or whatever in your patterns to build around them. Um, and what I mean by iterative placement is... There's going to be a lot of you placing or trying to build the entire pattern and at the last minute you notice it's um, not in range of AI or it's uh, bumping into or overlapping a different pattern that you wanted to build or uh, it doesn't have the right amount of connections to your engine room or whatever and then you have to demolish everything and then do it again. Uh, try and do it one piece at a time, your most critical pieces first. Um, but again, you do need everything blueprinted first, but the reason I say do it per pattern and don't go from pattern to pattern to pattern uh, is because of the three hour demolish uh, timer. Um, it's very possible that you're uh, at it for longer than three hours and then the first pattern you laid, you have to remove later on and yada, 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 you get friendly fire locked, it's no good. Uh, and don't forget to consider uh, where you're going to place your OBS bunkers. These are critical for both intel coverage and for spotting for your artillery. Uh, you, you're, any, any base needs at least two artillery guns, preferably three for QRF purposes. Uh, and they really only need to be 120 mil guns because 150 is for attacking and 120 mil is enough for defending because there's no way they're going to be uh, in range of your already position for long enough to tech concrete for you to need 150 guns to kill their push. So it's all going to be tier two anyways, which just dies to do 120 mil easily enough. And don't forget about your emplacement ranges such as Starbreakers and EATs and you know, account for those. While you're blueprinting, always watch your map. It's very possible a partisan runs up. And if look at all the shit that I blueprinted, if you had an SMG, you could just walk up and shoot all of this shit. And then I'd have to relay it all and readjust. And it's just a pain in the ass. So just make sure you kill them before they come close. The best way to practice the layout that you want in the build position that you picked out before the war is during dev branch or resistance phase. This top image I did during resistance phase, I measured everything out. I was like, okay, this fits. And if you look closely at the bottom image, I still had to make some changes during the actual war because I had some improvements in mind. So it's pretty nice to have that uh, time and space to build because all the best spots currently are already built at this stage of the war. So you can't really plan anything out. You could also do it ad hoc, which I do sometimes, but, you know, pre-planning is always better. Also, uh, one little tip to deal with, like, partisans shooting at your blueprints, like, don't just shovel a thing once, put, like, you know, maybe three or four into it, since, like, you're going to have to wait a few, few seconds to place a piece anyway, you know, just make it a little bit more resistant getting shot up. Smart, yeah, it takes more bullets the further along uh, you've dug the piece out. That's smart, Sammy, good one. Anybody else? Questions? If you're right. defending a coastline or from naval warfare, is it better for 150 or 120? Mm, I actually am not experienced enough fighting large ships. I don't know if 150 is more efficient at killing them or making holes. Uh, it depends what you have on hand, to be honest. If you have 150 nearby, then make 150. I mean, that's fair, but 150 is a bit more of a logistical effort, but um, and you have to wait longer for the tech. So, of course, at first, you always have a 120 position, and then you swap it out for 150 later if needed. If you have the luxury of 150, you can do it, but honestly, I find 120 to be plenty for defense. Like, as I, mes as I mentioned, any attacker is not going to have concrete, so it's whatever. Okay, let me take a sip. The colonials. the colonials will own trench or... And placed 150 in the <laughs> so it doesn't. That's true. The howies, the howies will have to take care of their art. Yeah. Yeah. I just reached level 21. Level 21, nice. Congrats. Okay. 
So, the next step is uh, obstacles and troubleshooting of your placement because there's always going to be an ideal grand plan of what you wanted to build and then it just doesn't work due to obstruction or like it just says unsuitable for terrain and you can't figure out what's wrong. Um, there's a great guide in the BBB Discord uh, by Tseko, um which lists basically every single instance in the game where the game says you can't play something but there's a workaround for it. Um, so key is to understand what's happening. Like often people are like um, um, building trenches and they look at the visual model and they're like, hey, why doesn't this fit? It's because uh, the game forces a rectangular like obstruction for each trench. I don't know why. Quarter pieces are actually squares um, when you consider the obstruction system of the game. Hence why sometimes it looks like it should fit, but it doesn't because it's actually sticking out a little bit. Same for octagons, which are actually squares. Uh, same for world assets such as big rocks, which extend very far underground, thus disallowing builds. And um, one of the workarounds is listed here, which is using a small gauge reel to extend your underground uh, connector range uh, up to 20 meters, which is very nice. These are all names for different workarounds. I'm not going to go over them. Um, again, they are listed in the BBB Discord. I advise any serious builder to join there and look at the guides. Um, but the key to uh, whenever you're troubleshooting stuff and you're changing stuff of your, out of your original plan is to always ensure full AT and MG and preferably we coverage and good firing angles. Uh, firing angles are key. And if you go to the Bunker Builder Discord, uh, the BBB Discord, um, every single pattern um, that people have thought out, uh, there's also programs that uh, they've planned them out in and they list the firing angles for the different things. And that's why... For example, in the current meta, we place our AT guns a little bit more forward. It's because they have a 180 degree firing arc. The MGs only have like, I don't know what it is actually, like a 30 degree firing arc anyways. So they can be placed a little bit more recessed into the pattern, for example. When in doubt or running into trouble and unable to figure it out, ask other builders for help. You can ask uh, for an architect. There's a channel called, called Architect Request in the BBB Discord. Um, if you need somebody to take a look at your build, you could ask in FMET, in the regiment chat, or, you know, like building, uh, like like your neighbor builders who have bases around you. You can just walk up and ask if they can help. In this game, it's usually how you get help. Just ask. That's it. Don't trust world chat completely. <laughs> Fair enough. They People, will uh, regularly say things that are, like, they might be right, but they might also be very wrong. Yeah, people can be very confidently wrong in this game. Just World chat that. thinks engine room should be on the core, so, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Okay. Almost done with the training, guys. <laughs> so, digging and upgrading the defenses. Um, again, only dig or upgrade defenses when everything is blueprinted. Common mistake that I see is people are like, hey, help me build. And then they get like five people to arrive to help build or hammer out their patterns and they're not done blueprinting everything. So they're like, okay, okay, just start digging and I'll just finish this blueprint or whatever. But then halfway through the second blueprint pattern, uh, they figure out they build it way too wide and they have to redo the first pattern. And there's nothing worse than having people help you out with something and then you delete their hard work. And you're like, oh shit, uh, but please do stick around and help dig this new pattern that I'm going to design now. It's, it's no use. So just blueprint it all first. Um, and then uh, the, the dig or build order is always as follows. Um, full patterns over your pits or your ammo rooms or your engine rooms, you dig those and you uh, upgrade them first. And if you are upgrading them, you do the front garrisons first, then the rest of the pattern, then you do the engine rooms behind, then you add pipes so that it has nighttime coverage, and then you do everything else, like arty pits and, and ammo rooms and uh, like random trenches in front and octagons in front and that type of stuff. Tips to getting a uh, demolition shovel or hammer squad going. Uh, map marker, uh, it usually helps <laughs> when you mention FMET. You're just like, FMET needs shovelers or whatever. People love helping us out because we have a great reputation and honestly, we're cool people. So that helps. You can ask in Reggie chat, although usually like people can be pretty busy, but sometimes it does work. You can also ask world chat um, and it helps when you're kind and nice and thankful and have commands to give out. <laughs> Um, also sometimes, yeah, go ahead. Region chat. yeah, region chat, also good, of course. Um, 
And sometimes um, there will be the, some of those temporary defenses that you placed earlier, earlier, like the pillboxes and stuff, and they'll have to be removed. Um, and you don't want a friendly fire lock yourself. If you're the main builder, you want a friendly fire lock yourself last, just in case people leave or whatever. Um, so it's also good to ask people to come throw mammons. And a pro tip for deleting tier 2 or tier 3 stuff that you have misbuilt or that you want to replace, attach a, t uh, attach a tier 1 piece to the, to the pattern that you want to delete. Uh, and then shoot it with an EMG. Uh, it is going to give you friendly fire lock, but then it's only 12.7 that you need to use. You don't need to bring and throw 100 mammons. Um, and you can also keep holding left click uh, even when you are already friendly fire locked and the EMG has like a 200, 12.7 uh, ammo box. So it keeps shooting until it reaches zero uh, as long as you don't let go of your left mouse button. So you can uh, actually shoot more friendly stuff that way. Yeah. Questions. Okay. So, uh, again, just to reiterate, step by step, uh, when you are building a base such as this, first things first is building pillboxes and intel for defense, then blueprinting whatever you want to build. Uh, <clears throat> finishing or, or when deciding the order uh, of what you're finishing or digging or upgrading, always build the pattern on the main attack factor first which is this southwest area at Spit Rocks, of course. Uh, then you want to build up, uh, like that's what I show here. I replaced the tier one or the pillbox stuff that I had here with um, uh, proper tier two, which eventually becomes concrete, of course, patterns. This is the main attack vector. So I built that first, or we built that first. Sorry, I shouldn't talk in the first person because I had a lot of help. Um, and then I did the secondary attack vectors, which are still like uh, the, the primary dark green lines that I showed in an earlier slide, which is the northwest and then the southeast. And I le we left um, the northwest, or sorry, northeast uh, for last, because uh, that's the most unlikely angle of attack. But you do, of, of course, eventually need to build it. Uh, don't mind the M sub counts. This is just the only image I had of that stage. So. It's very cool. If you're concreting stuff, first things first, Howie pads, uh, which is the blank squares that you left over in the tier two pattern, those take 24 hours to dry and only then are you able to place howitzers on it, which is why you do them first. Um, second is the ops bunkers, uh, the ops piece itself. You don't need to concrete the engine room that's attached to it because it increases the range from I think 130 to 180 meters. I'm not sure, but it increases the range of the intel gathering. Uh, then you do the uh, rest of the main pattern, which isn't, oh, sorry, then you do the front of the garrisons of the patterns. So that's the, um, the MG uh, parts, the AT parts, or the RG parts. Then you do the rest of the patterns so that the complete defensive patterns are completely concreted and strong. Then you do uh, secondary patterns, such as the ones that are guarding the inside of the gate or um, like internal defenses or whatever. Uh, then you concrete the octagon pits that are along the main attack vectors um, because uh, the concrete version of the octagon increases the health of the emplacement that's inside of it uh, by a lot. <clears throat> and then finally, this is a bit of a, a hot topic. Uh, some people um, also concrete their ammo or engine rooms. Some people don't like to because it's pretty expensive and the health of ammo and engine rooms is already pretty low. So you, you're not really helping all that much. Plus, it's harder to rebuild concrete. So if the engine rooms die to already or whatever, um, people are unable to rebuild them. But it's really your personal choice because in the end, it does protect better from fire and it's a bit, it has a bit more damage resistances and a, little, a bit more health. Um, so I feel like it's fine if you have concrete uh, to spare, but usually the faction doesn't. So you can just leave these if you don't need them. Um, of course, with each of these steps, um, the material and MSOP cost will go up. But luckily, um, you do get a grace period for upgrading stuff to certain tiers. I think tier one is like a 12 hour grace and then tier two is like 24 and then concrete has like 40. I, I don't know the exact numbers. The wiki has them. 72 hours. For there you go. Three. 72. Um, which saves you on MSOP costs during that period. So that's nice. Sammy? There's also slightly difference between trenches and bunkers for some reason, but it's not. Uh -huh. Right. Well, at least it does save you a little bit of MSOPs in a pinch. Uh, it's not really something you can bank on, but I mean, it's nice to have. Uh, don't bother ever concreting a connector or like regular trenches. The octagons, of course, yes. But I mean, the regular trenches have such high damage resistance to explosives. It doesn't really make sense concreting them. It's really a waste of concrete and your own effort. So uh, I advise against it. Um, there's certain very niche situations where it can help, like 
concreting um, the trenches that provide power to your garrisons, but honestly, I never bothered. I don't know if anybody has, really. Uh, Arty Pit, I concrete them so you can put the overhead cover, but that's about it. Oh, right. Yeah, maybe that that's a situation where it can also happen. Yeah, true. Any questions? Okay, I think this is the... Yeah, this is like the, 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 the second to last slide. Uh, it's the what's next slide, because once you are done building everything, there's a couple things you got to keep in mind. And it's important, like if you're an infra leader, or whatever, that you make sit reps about this, or if you're if you're leading a group of builders that you inform them of this. Uh, keep an eye on important tech unlocks, like 120 mil. Um, upon that unlock, you need to place your guns and you need to get ammo in your ammo rooms. Uh, upon 150 unlock, you need to replace those guns and replace the ammo in your ammo rooms with 150, if that's your preference. Uh, I haven't done it for Spit Rocks because I don't really see the need. We haven't been attacked all that much, etc., etc. Once you unlock eats, you place those. Same goes for EMGs. Actually, I forgot to put those. You can put EMGs in front of those in those front octagons while you wait for EATs to tech. Uh, Starbreakers, uh, pretty expensive, so I don't like to put them in all of my octagons, but I put them along the main road, which is also why, uh, for example, on the right hand side, you see I place. Uh, ammo rooms behind some of my patterns so that people can run through the pattern and uh, reload the Starbreaker quickly. Um, what you don't want is that somebody has to place a pallet next to the EAT because pallets die very, oh, sorry, next to the Starbreaker because pallets die very quickly to RD or enemy tanks or whatever. Then, once your build's done, uh, try and build signs around your base with directions uh, for those unfamiliar or QRF in your base while you're offline. A sign such as this, like, hey, there's an ammo room back here that you can use or fill. Or a sign such as this, where you teach people uh, how to load the ammo room efficiently using a small gauge, um, which is also the add QOL functionality, is building this small gauge, for example, to load the ammo room. It's pretty nice. Um, and this is also a debated topic, but placing and stashing QRF vehicles, never load them with ammo, never put fuel in them, uh, but you can have them sitting in your base so that people can quickly load them up. Uh, the reason I say don't fuel or put ammo in them is because if partners get inside, they have uh, a field day with it. Um, important QRF vehicles that are not mentioned enough are fire trucks. Fire is devastating for your base, especially while it's not been concreted yet. Uh, I like to have multiple around my base, uh, some of them kind of hidden, where even uh, allies can't see them, uh, from at least from the road or from the bunker base that they spawn at, because somehow those things disappear like crazy, like they get yoinked daily somehow, I don't know where they go, uh, but fire trucks are critically important, and also make sure they are, they are filled with water, of course, because otherwise, what, what are they even for? Then there's some daily tasks or bi-daily tasks or every four days or whatever um, to keep in mind. Uh, checking and refilling the MSUP tunnels to target levels. Uh, engine rooms, uh, same thing. Uh, placing and replacing mines every two days because they disappear after a 48-hour period. Uh, of course, uh, when you wake up or during the night or whenever there hasn't been somebody on the build crew online, uh, check the bunker base and static base supply levels. Like, does it have 200 shirts? Does it have enough rifles? Does it have enough white ash? Because anybody curiosing your base uh, would like to have supplies. Um, Check and ensure you have sufficient amount of cranes and QRF vehicles around the base. Last thing you want is for people to have to build those in the heat of the moment. And also, this is something people often forget, but all of those eats and all of those arty guns and all of those ammo rooms, uh, it's possible that during the night people use them and that they're low on ammo. And nobody except the builders of the base themselves usually care enough to check whether those need to be filled. Um, so I like to have 15 shells inside of my eats. Uh, a shell in the chamber for the Starbreaker and the Arty guns and the ammo rooms, of course, completely full. And the additional small gauge flatbed also filled is nice to have. Am I forgetting any daily tasks? Natasi probably knows. Oh, I wasn't listening. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you. Okay, Randy. Diesel generators? Uh, yeah, it's the second one. Oh, wait, you mean like for the MSOP fact or whatever? Yeah, that can also Yes, kind of. If you have the MSOP fact, otherwise, yeah, engine rooms need to fill those um, to power your garrisons. The nice thing, though, is with the last fuel update that they did, uh, engine rooms now actually last for four days. So you need to refuel your OBS and your bunkers every four days instead of every two. Oh, nice nice uh, benefit. Sw sweep for listening, kids. Yes, Please. yes, that's a, an important one that I forgot. Um, we have a couple of uh, OBS bunkers in this base. You can tell from the big intel range. Um, there's one here, there is one here, and there is one up here. 
Uh, and within 80 meters of those, um, they can place listening kits which can tap your intel, which is bad because then they know what's going on inside your base. So there's, a, I think, at the bottom of this cliff we have to check daily, bottom of these cliffs, and then up here, I think. Um, but yeah, that's also good to do a daily sweep. Um, nice trick there is uh, turning down all of the volume in your game, except for the SFX volume, which you turn way the fuck up. You might get deaf when a truck drives by, but you can uh, hear the sound of the uh, the listening kit much clearer. Good one. Anything else? All right. That's the end of this bunker-based design theory training. There is a lot more to learn, a lot more esoteric knowledge, but honestly, most of that is gained from experience. Uh, I personally really love building in the game, despite all of its quirks, all of the time investment that you need to put in, all of the frustrating thing that can happen, like your base burns down during the night and there's nothing you can do. I still like it a lot, and I encourage everybody in FMAT to try it out. Um, maybe look around the, uh, the VC or the room here. Uh, these are all people that have followed this training. Um, so maybe like for the next war or the war after, or maybe in five wars, you get the uh, the builder's itch. Uh, you can come back to this training or these slides and have them guide you towards building your first proper fortress. Um, and I've, I started building these fortresses in like war like, like 80 or 81, and I've only built five maybe so far, uh, along with the help of many other people. Um, and the first four were absolutely terrible, and this is the first one that I can actually say that I'm pretty proud of, hence why I feel confident enough to give this training now. And it will also take you some time to reach that level of confidence where you feel like your base is actually finally a proper fortress. And it's also possible that your base dies to bullshit that you didn't account for, and don't beat yourself up over it. It's just the nature of the game. It's... Like, defenses and bunkers are pretty strong, and frontliners often complain about how much effort they have to put into killing them, but honestly, if you see how much effort the builder puts in to place it all, and to get it upgraded, and defended, and maintained, I feel like it's more than fair. And possibly, especially Tier 2, is actually kind of weak. Tier 3 is fine, but Tier 2 is like, it's a piss take at the end of the war, but uh, early work it can be pretty nice. I hope that you all learned a lot, and we do have room for more questions, general questions, maybe not to do with the presentation here. Otherwise, um, this does end the training, and I would like to thank you all for being here. Uh, one more, well, one quick question about just the presentation overall. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that the slides, as long as the recording of this presentation, were going to be left somewhere. Uh, uh, where specifically is that going to be, so I can come back to it? Uh, I, I'll get one of the, um, the, the, the council or leads to post it in more SIPREP, but I'll also uh, place them in the resources channel at the bottom of the Discord. I have several recordings of different trainings in there. There's a frontline build training, which has to do with tier two and trench design, which is way different from what I explained here, way different philosophy. Um, and there's also uh, another training on frontline supply, for example, in there, but I'll, I'll add this to the list. Put it in the infrastructure as well. Yeah, I'll pin it in infrastructure too. All right, if you, fantastic. If, you, uh, if you're very new, I think starting out, out with like OBS bunkers in the back line is a good start. Yeah, true. The bunker or anti-partisan bases in small choke mm -hmm. points because um, those don't take a lot of effort to build and run. Um, the, the fortresses, like I mentioned here, uh, very fun to build. Uh, also a little stressful, of course, but... Um, yeah, like trying this stuff out is good. If there's resistance phase or dev branch on, it's basically free game to build. Uh, during an, an actual active war, like I said, if you want to learn to build, you basically have to do it live, if you know what I mean. Because use it like like taking an empty spot and building it up is pretty useless. It's just gonna tank the modifier. It doesn't benefit the faction in any way. Um, so if you do try and build or learn to build one of these bigger bunker bases. Just do it somewhere where it's actually useful, despite the risk, because you learn the most by engaging with that risk and actually encountering partisans or an enemy push or whatever. That's how you actually learn. So feel confident enough to do that thing. Another tip I thought of, maybe it's more basic, but if you're next to a subhex that has a better modifier, you can put your tunnels in that subhex instead, and it will alleviate some MSUP struggle. It didn't... Yeah, didn't happen at speed trucks, but yeah, it doesn't. Uh, yeah. The, the fucking sub region is so big, it doesn't actually benefit us. But this one's poor, for example. 
this one's very good actually like if this was within 100 meters i would put the tunnel right there and it would um be considered very good modifier despite all of the things that it's supplying being in a very poor region so that's a good point i see anything else um i have a question regarding the overall time investment uh for you for the main builder i guess it's like a full war investment like you can't do much else yeah so if you're building concrete or if you are building one of those critical positions such as a static base uh, it's definitely a war dedication look real life happens it can always happen that you as the lead designer uh, get injured or there's something else in your life why you cannot spend time on the video game of course real life comes first but it does suck so if you know that you're you're you have something coming up in like a month like despite it being a month away wars these days can definitely take longer than a month um, so do consider that like I, I don't say don't do it if you have something coming up in a month where you have to be gone for a few days but then at least before you start to build you have to find somebody to take over when that does happen you know what I mean because this war uh, we actually had a situation um, at Sanctum, which was built by 82DK Creeker, and he is now on vacation or whatever, he's unable to, to maintain this. So we had to find somebody else to maintain this, and that just sucks because nobody else is going to be as dedicated in the maintenance or as engaged with the base as the main lead builders. Um, so it's probably hard to find somebody to just take over something that costs like 600 M-subs an hour, right? Because what's the fun or the benefit for them? They don't have the investment in the base. Uh, they didn't have the fun of building and designing the base or defending it over the course of two weeks or whatever. All that they're left with is the shit stick of maintenance, which is the least fun part of the game in my opinion. So try and account for that. But of course, there are always situations where you can't. Yeah. Um, but actual, my actual question was rather leading like uh, with uh, co-builders because I know that I will never be a main builder because I like doing many things in this game. I can't focus on one thing. I try to, I just can't. Mm -hmm. I want to try everything. Makes sense. And uh, how much do you think like uh, for a co-builder, the actual time investment for being an actual benefit to the build would be? Well, let's ask one of my co-builders. Does anyone want to chime in? I mean, I can say all the time, like, random people are like, hey, can somebody help me build? Like, there's just tons of people who know nothing that are always like, can somebody help me? And, like, that's a good place for you to, like, kind of learn and practice when you don't have to commit to it. Yeah, yeah but, but when you're asking yeah. about the commitment for a co-builder, I don't know if Randy... Yeah, well, they're, being... they're, they're main builders, but I mean, like, Natasi, Randy, Sammy, like, one of you, how much time would you say the investment is for you as co-leads? Um, it's definitely, like, I mean, it's nice because you can afford to, like, take a day off. You don't have to, like, always be there if, like, you know, like, obviously, like, still, you know, you should do things, but, like, you know, you don't, almost don't feel quite as, like... And you, you'll feel guilty for not doing anything for a while, but, like, you know, you can take a day off and, like, it's not the end of the world. Yeah, and as long as you communicate with the rest of the build team, right? Like, if you even if you have to take off three or four or a week, uh, just tell people up front. Don't tell, tell them the day off so that they can account for it and maybe find somebody else to help with the maintenance or, you know, at least realize that they have to put in more time. Because it, but what sucks the most is that they find out late, right? Or the day of, where they're like, okay, I'm going to be gone for a week now. And it's like, okay, well, I would have liked for you to communicate that earlier. If, if you have the open communication, it shouldn't be a problem. It's also yes. good to just keep timers for your critical shit. That, like, engine rooms, when they will need to be refueled, and mines, when they dis do they spawn after two days. Just so you know when some things has to be done. Yeah, in, 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 in the group DM that we have, um, what we do is when we replace the mines, for example, refuel everything, we use hammer time um, to place a Unix timestamp for two days or four days from now. Uh, and then we pin the message so that people know when to watch out for replacing the mines or resupplying the base or whatever. Does that answer your question? Yeah, pretty much. Thank you. No problem. Any other questions? Uh, just one more. Mm -hmm. Do you already have a plan in mind to build a fortress next war? <laughs> uh, if I do, it's not going to be as the main designer. Let's put it that way. Because uh, I do like doing this, but doing it back-to-back -back wars is uh, 
it's it's a lot of time investment which i don't really currently have especially since i'm uh leaving on vacation in april so uh, not me but i would like to co-lead and guide you uh, are you would you be open to dms later yeah of course i'm at work right now but i might dm you later about something i've been workshopping yeah no problem uh and if you i was looking to maybe do that next war as like one of my first big builds so as in you have something in mind or you're aware of what i'm doing and want to help me no no i was just planning on um trying to build something it obviously i'm not anywhere near as good as vinci or anything like that but i wanted to i got the itch to build and i oh, was man. planning on building like a build don't uh, worry about it if you next, search next if, you, if you search the discord for fort flank you can find my first fortress it's hilarious when i look back on it now but <laughs> i mean like the only way you really learn is by doing it and you can build big and it can all die and then you learn from how it died that's really how it goes right i've built a couple bases before i just haven't built anything um yeah significant it's search fort flank this will be entertaining oh it is entertaining um <laughs> But Ender uh, and Decisive, if you both want to like practice or learn the design part of the base, what you can do is find a location where, for example, you have to defend from the north and the south, and then you both just divide the work, and you'll be like, okay, you defend, you design the north defenses, and I'll do the south. That can work, or you can just do like separate uh, uh, bunkers, but then it's probably going to be hard to build very big because we'll be dividing the uh, efforts of the Reggie, but. Yeah, also make a council ticket when you do that or when you're planning on doing that so that they are aware and you can ask for help and that they okay the build and that type of stuff. There's a reason they call it flanks material and transport. Ha ha ha.